And I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, please. Romans chapter 8, we'll be looking at 20, 28 through 30, verses 28 through 30. And uh, as we get going there, you notice my, my title is God Confident. And I want to encourage you to be confident in God. And uh, this is an interesting passage that, that is probably way beyond our understanding in the big picture. But let me ask you a couple of questions when we think about confidence. Let me ask you, how confident you are you in the TV news? <laughs> What's so funny? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, go, I went ahead and did the fake news deal there just, to, just for fun. But are you, uh, uh, how confident are you in, uh, in the candidates' ads? <laughs> Uh, downright sick of them, right? And uh, yeah, how confident are you that are you that Ohio State's going to win next week? Uh, boy, that's not very confident, or something, you know? Yeah, after a week ago, you don't know, right? Anyway, uh, anything can happen. I bet every one of us are confident we're going to, after the service this morning, as you go out, you, you're, you just expect your car to start, don't you? You're confident your car is going to start. How many of you have had a car fail before in starting? Yeah, yeah, we probably almost all have, haven't we? But we're pretty confident in that, and we're, uh, we're confident when we, when we uh, flip a light switch, we're going to have light. You know, we're just pretty confident in that. And of course, we've all had some failures along that line, and uh, we're confident. I left my phone in my pocket because uh, you know, I'm pretty confident. I could probably, oh, there's a text, just a minute. No. <laughs> uh, you know, just, uh, you know, we, we're confident we get a, that our phones are going to work, aren't we? We're just, we're just sure that that's going to happen. And uh, when, you know, when I, we've been working on, uh, we've been doing some new members classes, as you saw the list of new members that we've mentioned. And uh, one of the things, one of the things that members of Community Bible Church are confident, we're confident that the Bible is the Word of God. Amen. Yeah, we're confident of that. We're confident that salvation is by grace through faith and not works. Amen. Oh, that was a little puny. <laughs> We're confident that salvation is by grace. That's the old, old story we've been singing about, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And the moment you trust him, you have eternal life. Amen. Oh, good. Whew. I was a little worried there. New, some of the new members were wondering what's going on. You know, no, we don't say a lot. We, there's not a lot of amens, I know. But, uh, but anyway, and you know, we're confident that we, we urge others. We're so confident that salvation is by grace, that the old, old story is the answer, that we're willing to stretch ourselves and, and, and tell others about the old, old story, aren't we? We're, we're confident, we're so confident that it's the truth that we're willing to share others and put ourselves on the line to tell others about that. And we're confident, we're confident then that those who know Christ as Savior are to live like, live like God wants us to live according to the scripture. So we're confident in some of those things. And our memory verse that Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know, we, we say that verse we're, because we're confident in, in uh, that God has saved us by his mercy and we ought to respond to that. Now, how confident are you then as we get to our passage here? It says all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. How confident are you in that truth? That God is working all things together for good. We look on the back of our, our bulletin and it is filled with needs, isn't it? Some of you are here with uh, crutches and canes and, and uh, a boot and just, you know, and we, uh, you know, a mask because you're depleted and, you know, we're here with our ailments. Is God working that for his good? Is that... Or is it just some things? How about other things that we face day by day? You know, be it breakdowns or loss, 
be it crashes and sadness and stress and frustrations and the economy and the election and the hurricane. What about all those things? Let's read our per verse. Come on back with me. Romans chapter 8. Go to verse 26. And uh, I, I, I can hardly leave without looking at the word hope in verse 20, 25. Because I have the word hope circled in my Bible. And I have arrows pointing down to uh, the rest of this passage. And I probably should have. I just about did put the word hope in there. Hope in God's confidence. Hope in being God. But I just couldn't get it smooth enough uh, it, to suit me. So I just left God confident. But I'm thinking hope as we come into verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also, so in light of that hope, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, hmm, Notice in verse 26, we didn't know. Now we do know. What do we know? And we know that all things, except those that we don't like to think it, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of men, among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these also he called. Whom he called, these also he justified. Whom he justified, these also he glorified. And we're going to stop there, but I can't wait till the next message in this list. I can't wait for the security that we, we're going to look at as we look at the remainder of the chapter here uh, the next time, or at least part of it. But when we think about verse uh, 28... Verse 28, coming from the idea of prayer that we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit does something supernatural. The, and God does something supernatural in searching our hearts. So the Spirit intercedes, and, and God searches our hearts, and somehow that all works together. And so, so the apostle here says, we know. We know. We don't just think, well, maybe... We know, and in fact, the word that's used there is a confident know, knowing, uh, not know, N-O, confident knowing, and, uh, in, and it's in contrast to that lack of knowing in verse 26. But this word know is, uh, is, has the idea to perceive with the mind's eye. And sometimes, in fact, it is translated, this word is translated see, S-E-E, -E, more than it is the word no in the King James, which is interesting. Uh, in, in this, this is the word used of the wise men. And in Matthew chapter 2, in verse 2, in verse 9, in verse 10, this word is used. And it says, we have seen his star. We saw his star. Who's, why did they say his star? Because be, behind the seeing was some knowing. Behind the seeing was some knowledge that they had. And it, and it very, very well may go right back to Daniel. But that's another, that's another thing. I don't want to get sidetracked. But they, they saw and they, they were looking for the king of the Jews. That's, they knew something based on what they saw. There was seeing and knowledge going hand in hand. And... Uh, and then there's another use of this word no in Matthew 2.16. And, uh, and, and it's about Herod. When Herod saw that the wise man deceived him and went another way or tricked him and went another way, he saw, well, was Herod there watching the wise man go the other way? No. This is a perception of knowledge. He, he learned about this. Somebody told him about this, his spies or whatever it was. This is perception. And so there's, there's knowing something and the word saw or see goes hand in hand with that in the context here. Now, let me give you one more example. In, in uh, Matthew 28, 5 and 6, the angel's at the tomb and he used this word two times. And he, he said uh, in verse 5, it says, he knew they were seeking Jesus. 
So that's the same word. He knew they were looking for Jesus. The ladies were looking for Jesus. And then in verse 6, it says, come see where the Lord lay. They were, they were supposed to put something together. It just wasn't that somebody stole his body. They were to put it together based on Scripture that, that uh, when they saw that empty tomb, aha, he is risen. That's what they should have been able to understand. But... We'll just, we're, I just want to give you the idea of this word. This word has the idea that in contrast to knowing how, uh, that we don't know how to pray, we are confident. We know, we see God is working all things for good. Now, we may not literally see what God's doing, but we know and in our mind's eye, we perceive that God is working all things together for good. And uh, I think we need to go, we need to keep it in mind of the context here that it was the spirit that was doing something beyond what we can see. But we, we trust the Lord that the spirit intercedes in our prayers. We trust the Lord that he knows our hearts and he's somehow working with the spirit, uh, with the spirit, with our prayers as well. And so there's this supernatural, supernatural things are happening when we pray that we might not fully understand, but we trust God so we know that, and we can be confident that the same God who takes care of our prayers through the Spirit and through the, through the Father, this same God, we can be confident in Him that He is working all things for good. And when we say all things, I've already, I've already stretched your minds a little bit about that, but uh, this simple, wor simple word, all things, uh, this, you know, we're to pray for all things, aren't we? Pray about all things. Hmm. And then we're trusting God to intercede, or the Spirit to intercede, and God to know what we really meant. And then, he, and then as a result of that, we're trusting God that all things are going to work together. In other words, we're trusting the God who can do all that to go way beyond what we ask or think, Ephesians 3. We're trusting the God who can do that. And so we'll pray about everything. We pray with thanksgiving, and all means all. All things means all things. And I, I just I wanted to just put some things together here. That means the good, what we might consider, what we might see are good, consider good or bad, things that are exciting or dull, things that are that are uh, uh, joyful or sad, or joy or joy or sorrow, things that are I'm okay to pain, things that are maybe some things early or late, maybe some things loving and hating maybe it's light or heavy or light and dark or relaxing and stressful or you know easy and hard and we could go on and on and on clean and dirty free or expensive for or against life and death all things and i know that's not an exhaustive list but he says it works together for good and when we say good here it evidently isn't based on just what we've already talked about all things, it evidently isn't what I think is good. We got to let God determine what is good because we have a God who is greater than, you know, his ways are not our ways. We have a God that is beyond us and we can trust him that he is doing what he determines is good not what i think is good Amen. and that's that's easy preaching hard living even though i got an amen out of that yeah that's easy to say because i don't like it i don't like it when something breaks i don't like it when someone lets me down i don't like it when and the list could go on and on and on. And sometimes I don't think that's very good. But it isn't my place to determine how God's working even through that. What's good about a destructive hurricane? And yet when Jesse was up here sharing with us the ministry of the guys that went down to the hurricane relief, 
he told us that the gospel was going forward. He, you had a couple of tears in your eyes. I don't know if that was up here, but you did for sure when you told me. You know, you were spiritually moved, right? Spiritually moved by what he was experiencing when he was down there in the, in the muck. Huh. What if someone, what if one person through that hurricane that destroyed billions of dollars worth of stuff, what if one person came to know Christ because of that? Amen. <laughs> You're getting ahead of me, girl. No, yeah, yeah. But what's, what's a few billion dollars to our government, to the insurance agencies, to the, and even personal loss that people experience, like some of our friends, Pete or Tina or whatever? What is that compared to a soul? What's good? What's good is what God does and is doing and will do, period. We have skeptics all around us that doubt God's, God's existence because of a tragedy and some are actually blaming God for allowing or sending the storm. But you know what Jesus said? Jesus said the sun shines and the rain falls on the just and the unjust in Matthew chapter 5, 45. Huh. The sun or the rain? Satan tried to turn Job away from God in, in every way, didn't he? including a storm that blew his house down on top of his kids. But God had a bigger purpose. In Romans chapter 5 and verses 1 to 5, you have a progression there of things. Uh, it, it says tribulation works patience, patience, experience, and experience hope. We have a God of hope who is at work beyond what we ask or think. Our God is greater. And so we have assurance from the word of God that the Holy Spirit, that we have the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of trouble. We have a, an assurance from God's word right in this chapter. We have an assurance that, that we are the children of God, even in the midst of trials. We have an assurance from God that we are joint heirs with Christ. In other, in other words, Something better's coming. Something a lot better's coming. And we know. And we know. Even though we might not act like it. That all things work together for good. To those who love God. And are the called according to his purpose. Wow. That's pretty amazing stuff. When he says those loving God to those love God, I'm convinced, I've, I've kind of wrestled with this a little bit, but I'm convinced it's about, it's not about a degrees of love. And I think we could get distracted about the degree. Oh, well, you, you may have even heard it or even thought it your own self. Well, they must not have loved God very much because they're going through. No, no, it's not about, I think this is more identifying identifying believers. Only believers are lovers of God. And I think that's the general, he's just using this term, <clears throat> this term to emphasize that he's talking about believers. And, uh, you know, it, it's not about you and me judging someone else's love. This is about us. This is encouraging every believer to show your love for God, to love God and trust him to working, work his good in us. And then he uses the phrase, to the, the called according to his purpose. And I purposely, in my, in my notes there, I, I wrote, I put called ones. Because this, this word called here, I know the New King James uses the phrase, the called. This is a noun, this is not a verb. This is a noun, it's not a verb. So he's talking about individuals. Those loving God are those who are the called. That's God's term for it. And uh, you, you might remember, you might remember back to Romans 1 when we started this months ago. But in Romans 1, we saw the introduction to this book. 
And Paul says in verse 7, he says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called saints. There's the word to be there, and the word to be is in italics. And, and uh, it happens to be that the word called is a noun or an adjective, just like, in other words, there's no difference between uh, those in Rome who are beloved and those who are called and those who are saints. These are three descriptions of these people. And, and uh, so that's the point that he's, that's what he's saying here. And uh, our translators, uh, many of the translators put the word to be in there, which really changes called to a verb. And that's not the point. We are called ones, if, if you can follow my thinking along that. And so believe in, believers in Rome were beloved, called ones, and saints. And then Paul even described himself in Romans 1.1 1, 1, as a called one. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called. And then you have to be an apostle. No, it's a noun. Called one, a called one, and an apostle. So this is an adjective describing Paul just, just every, much as bit, every bit as much as him being a bondservant and an apostle. So Paul wanted, wanted uh, these believers to know, yep, I'm a called one, I'm an apostle, I'm a bondservant, and I'm writing to you who are beloved and called and, uh, and saints. And so he's using this phrase, using this word, just to identify, identify his people. And so if you keep that in mind, as we move on to the, into the text, into the next section, that's why he does what he does when he gets to verse 29 and 30. He is explaining, uh, explaining this, this idea of called and putting it in order in what God does. And so we can be, and so point number two, verses 29 and 30, we're confident God works his purpose. We're confident that God works his purpose because, in fact, the very first word in verse 29, for can be translated because, and so it just gives us a, the reason or the explanation as you get to verse 29. So all things work together for good. Why? Because... God is sovereign. God is in charge. God is doing something way beyond what we ask or think. And that, so we need to link these, these verses together. And, it, and the first point he's making is God foreknew called ones. Where did I get called ones? We're going to see it in a moment, but he, that's who he's talking about. And so I wanted to keep that context alive for us and use this phrase. The word foreknew is in the past tense, so he's looking in a, and it's, and it's the sense of a completed action. God foreknew. How, how can we say God foreknew? What is it? Well, we're taught from, as children, that God is omniscient. God knows all things, past, present, and future. And I'm saddened by some who limit God's foreknowledge maybe even in this passage, and conclude that he was surprised by what man would do. That's out there, by the way, that God could be surprised by something that you and I could do. Whew. That's a pretty dim view of God. But we take it as, as it is written, our all-knowing God has known all things from eternity, including people, and that's why our text says whom in verse 29, and it goes back to the called ones in verse 28. These are, this is who he's talking about. And what's our first inclination? We want to say, I want to know when this happens. God foreknew. It's before time. What does that mean? Well, it's before he, before he created heavens and earth and put the light in the sky and the evening and the morning were the first day. It's before that. It is before time. He foreknew before time. And yet it affects, it affects us even at this moment. But our God dwells outside of time. Can you wrap your head around that? We think we can. 
<laughs> we think we can wrap our, if, and there's another phrase, God dwells in the eternal now. <laughs> My God's big. That's what I wrote in the email that I sent you this week. How big is your God? How big is your God? And our God is greater than everything. But if we, if we had to identify the, the timing, it'd be that he foreknew before creation. Before time, God foreknew the called ones. God predestined the called ones. That's the next phrase there. Those he foreknew, he predestined. And we see that, we hear that word, and we want to panic, don't we? <laughs> what about predestination? What about this? Let's just see what God has to say here. Let's let it flow through and see what God has to say. He foreknew, those he foreknew, he predestined. And the word predestined literally means to mark out before time, beforehand. So you, he marked them out, and this has to do with people. He drew the lines and drew the circles or whatever it is. He made a mark. He marked them out before time. That's what God did. And uh, some of the other ways this word is translated in Scripture, in Acts 4.28, it talks about God's counsel determined beforehand. God's counsel was determined beforehand. Or in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7, the mystery was predestined before creation. That's an interesting thought. God had, God had those of us who live in the mystery dispensation of grace, he had that, it was his plan from the beginning. He didn't have to wait to see that the Jews rejected Christ. It was God's plan from the beginning, even though he didn't reveal it. It was in the mind of God, Ephesians 3.10 says. Ephesians 1, 1.5 and verse 11 and verse 11 both say, we were predestined to adoption and according to his purpose. So don't panic with the word. Here, here's what it is, and our God is big enough. And look what he says he's doing. God predestined the called ones to be conformed ones. Conformed, and uh, that idea of conformed is kind of interesting. Uh, you know, we're some of the, uh, I bet some of the computer games say, have some people that, some characters that morph into something or another. Is that, is that, yeah, there's something like that here and there. I don't know, uh, Transformers, or that's old, I know. I'm a little outdated, but uh, wasn't there a movie about that within the last dozen years? Okay, yeah, they transform. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm pretty up to date, aren't I? Yeah, but the, uh, th that's this word, the, the Greek word there is, is morph. That's morphos. And so it's, and he, God wants us to be conformed or formed together with his son. God's plan is for us to be morphed into his son. Ha. How's that going to happen? And, you know, I, I've given you, I give you a couple of points there and we could spend the whole time on this, but think about, we have a present relationship with him in the sense that we are in Christ. We're so in Christ that when God looks at us, in a sense, he sees Christ. We are in him. And then, yes, there's the idea of he wants to make us like Christ in our, in our daily walk and our daily living. That's usually what we think about here. But then, uh, then within this context, he, we are joint heirs with him. Interesting, and it, I think we could build on that more and more on this, on this idea. But here's God's plan. He predestined called ones to be conformed to his son. And why? So that his son would be the firstborn. So that his son would be glorified. That idea of firstborn has the idea of being number one. So that his son would be number one. And he wants us connected to that to be morphed into that in some way. And then the next point, God called the called ones. You know where I put the next word I put? Duh. <laughs> I mean, in, a, in my you know, that's such a simple statement. God called the called ones. Well, of course he did. God called the called ones and 
And the called ones, uh, you know, I mean, that, the called ones are go back to verse 28, go back to, and, and they were called by God, verse 30. So God did the calling, etc. And this too is a past tense. So it doesn't matter about human experience here. This is God, God doing this. And uh, I might think, oh yeah, it, there was a certain time in my life when I got saved and I was called by God. But you know what? This is a past. This is a past tense too, just like the other one. For no predestined called, our eternal God did something. Anyway, and our under, under our understanding of timing really doesn't matter. God called us, and then those same ones, the called ones, are justified. Justified by faith. Now here we have something that happened in my lifetime that I was justified when I believed the gospel at five or, or when I really got on track at 15 or whatever it was. Yeah, I was justified. You know what? This is a past tense too. Same thing. God accomplished this beyond, uh, well, he completed this. And that's the sense of this tense. He, God completed this, and I'm going to have to say even before time. God did this. And I can't wrap my mind around that perfectly. Because I know what I did. But my God is a big God. And he did something here. And he did this so that I can count on him that all things work together for good, no matter what I pray for, no matter how he answers. That's what the flow of the context here. Romans 5.1 says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. I wouldn't want anyone to walk away or anyone hearing it on the, on the YouTube to not understand that once you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again, once you trust him personally, you have, you have been justified. God declares you right in his sight at that moment, and you have an eternity with God. And so I urge everyone to trust Jesus Christ who died in their place, and we are right in God's sight. And then he uses the phrase glorified. God glorified the called ones. My human experience is that I've not been glorified yet. And anybody that knows me could probably prove it. But you know what? Our God dwelling in the eternal now says I'm glorified. You know what else? In Ephesians Ephesians 2, verse 6, he says, I'm seated in the heavenlies with Christ. I'm standing. I'm here. But God counts me glorified. He counts it as a finished track transaction, and that gives me hope. And so with that hopeful position, we can be confident that God is working all things for good to whom he called according to his purpose. You might have noticed, some of you that are students or have been around the Bible a while, I did not mention Calvinism. I did not mention Arminianism. I did not mention any other isms. We just kept to the context and the flow of the context and noted that our God backed his supernatural promise with supernatural action that he supernaturally called us. So I encourage you to just appreciate that God is God. You know, and, and appreciate maybe that we can't fully explain everything about him. Our God is so big that we can't understand everything. I'm glad I can't bring God down to my level. You know what that'd be? That would be idolatry. That would be idolatry. 
So I know that God is due glory. And so I encourage you to be God confident about all things. It's more reliable than light switches. It's more reliable than phones. It's more reliable than that pew that's holding you up. Rejoice that our faithful God has supernaturally worked all things for good for you who love him. Father, I praise you because of who you are. I praise you for what you've done. And I just want to exalt you for that position that we have with Christ. And I thank you and give you praise because you are the God who can do exceeding abundantly beyond all that I may even ask or imagine. Amen. Will you stand as we close our service?